This is a blaring out with Eric Blair show, and today I'm pleased to have 80s icon Josie Cotton on the show. How you doing today, Josie? I'm pretty good, Eric. So, Josie, what, at what point did you discover your voice? I discovered I had a love for singing when I was in grade school in choirs, and I uh, just enjoyed the the feeling and sound of harmonizing with others. <laughs> It was exhilarating, and I fell in love with it, but it was not m my first love in the arts. I, it was more dance and, and writing, and I was a pianist and whatnot. I, singing came much later. Were you doing it in bands? I did uh, sing in some bands uh, that, were, that were so scattered and unorganized that we never actually did live shows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just a lot of rehearsing and, and try everyone uh, wanting to do d different kinds of music. So. Um, so my you know, experience was, was limited to like garages. How did you come to sign with Bomp Records to put out the single for Johnny Are You Queer? Well, when I came to uh, Hollywood, it was uh, really to be a songwriter, and, and um, um, I had done various demos and whatnot, but I, actually I was on another label before Bomp Records, MSR. They signed Johnny Are You Queer went out of business and then Bomp basically was a phone call to Greg Shaw, Larson Payne said, I have this song called John Are You Queer? And he goes, I'll take it. Because he knew the song, you know, because the Go-Go's had sung it live mm -hmm. for quite a while. And um, so uh, that, that was how that, you know, began. It was just a phone call. So now what was the relationship with the Johnny Are You Queer and the Go-Go's? Did you shop it to them or what, what happened with that? Yeah, that's, there's a lot of misinformation about that. Basically, um, it started off as a, a fear song. It was like one line out of a fear song was, Johnny, are you queer? Johnny, are you queer? It was very frightening, as all their songs are, which is why we love them. But uh, the Payne brothers, who were working with the Go-Go's at the time, they pretty much discovered the Go-Go's at the Mass. Very few people know that. And they were working with Fear, Levi and the Rock Hats, and uh, Jane Whelan made the comment, uh, all the cute boys are gay, and a very cute little girl voice, and it w really was a phenomena going on. So he, he and his brother, Bobby, wrote the song more as a blues song for teenage girls. And they took this really hardcore punk line and made it into a very poppy, um, uh, tongue-in-cheek and innocent, and uh, really a song about unrequited love that has all kinds of ways of interpretation which is why I think everyone got so upset. They didn't know what was happening, nor did I. It was, it was a big blur of uh, you know, misinterpretation going on. So you end up doing the song. When they parted ways, the, the Go-Go's and the Payne brothers, um, um, they took the song from the Go-Go's and, and, and forbid them from singing it again. Mm. They never recorded it. Um, it was one of their famous songs, uh, but uh, they split, and so they were actually doing a demo tape of the song, and they needed a singer, and I just happened to be the girlfriend of Larson Payne, and I was a singer of sorts, and I just said, I'll do it, I'd like to do it, and, and uh, he goes, no, you can't do it, no girlfriend of mine is going to, blah, 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 and I went, oh, come on, you know, so and then that demo is what got signed uh, initially. So. That's crazy. Yeah. And then how did your life change when Electra Records re-released the single Johnny Are You Queer and the full-length album Convertible Music? Well, I got to say the biggest mistake I made was leaving Bomp Records because they were not afraid of the controversy. They embraced it. They in enhanced it. And, and uh, they knew that that was a very powerful thing. Electra uh, actually got cold feet and they pulled Johnny Are You Queer they pulled it from the record stores, they pulled it from the radio, they pulled it from all the dance clubs, they killed a hit record, which is always, I've never heard of that before in my life, but I've never also never heard of any song getting banned in Amsterdam, which Johnny U. Queer was banned. So that's going on my gravestone, people, but um, banned in Amsterdam. But, uh, you know, at any rate, so uh, Electra, it was wonderful doing convertible music, um, uh, but that, I have to say, I, I I think I would have I had a lot longer career if I had stayed with Bomp. They were they were more dedicated. They they didn't become um, um, uh, like like little chickens uh, running around trying to to appease the religious right. And also certain factions, the gay community in in New York, were offended by the song. Really? Yeah, they thought I, it was homophobic, and the religious right thought I was actually a gay guy. It was crazy how those two 
you know, groups came together and just like, you know, uh, in, in misinterpretations of the song. That's what was so interesting. They had, you know, this completely opposite and incorrect interpretations of the song, and yet that pretty much got me dropped from Electra Records. On top of the fact I wouldn't, uh, I refused to do a, a, a spread for, supposed to speak, for Pinout's uh, magazine. Oh, they wanted you to do a shoot for that? When Electra I, when I turned suggested? Them, when I turned it down, they dropped me, like, that. Doing the song, Johnny, Are You Queer, did that, was that what got you in the movie Valley Girl? Well, that, the song had actually kind of come and, uh, you know, gone, and um, I don't know if that song in particular, but they liked me a lot. They, they, uh, they tried to get the Go-Go's uh, in, in that movie, and they didn't have Johnny You're Queer, so uh, I guess, you know, they found me, and my producer kept hanging up on them. They go, who is this Martha Coolidge? And she goes, I want Josie. Go, blang, you know, and she's like, it's her again, and it was, a, it was actually a, a pursuit and a stalking, uh, you know, kind of detective story that she finally, you know, got us to agree to do it, and it's probably what kept me from being completely forgotten, you know. What was it like filming the movie Valley Girl with Nicolas Cage and E.G. Daly? Well, E.G. was really, was a very cool girl and I became friendly with her and Nicholas actually asked me out at some point and I turned him down. And uh, so... Why'd uh, you do that? Well, I had a boyfriend. I've always been very Oh, the guy in the band. Uh, well, he was my producer, yeah. So, yeah, I turned down... All kind, you know, I'm like, I stay in one relationship, and it's like one nightmare at a time. It's still how I live. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm just kidding. I'm just, no. Uh, don't take anything I say seriously. But uh, it was just short. I didn't know this movie was going to be a cult classic and that, you know, all these teenage boys were going to, like, you know, act, kind of fall in love with me or come of age or uh, it was going to change the face of music. And in, a, in a way, it kind of did. And uh, um, so, you know, of actual alternative music becoming mainstream and whatnot. I thought it was more for girls and fashion, but it was actually more for guys. Uh, the guys I meet in their 30s, that was their, like, I can be artistic and I can be hardcore and I mean, all these, like, you know, they don't have to be a dumb jock. Not that all jocks are dumb, but, you know, some are. And especially at that time, it was a, they kind of ruled the high schools and, you know, so that that movie, I, I was in and out so fast, it was just two days, and I didn't know. I thought it was like, I called it the movie that wouldn't die. It was like, that's one of my favorite movies. I go, really? I've only seen it once. And I have. I've only seen it once. It's amazing. You need to, like, rent it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> We need to rent it, the, re, the remastered version. The remastered? With the interviews, it has in, in like current interviews with Nicolas Cage and Martha Coolidge and the, the whole cast. They suppose they, they interviewed me for that too. They, they You're probably in there. And then a lot of people may not know this, but E.G. Daly's mom owned the Anti Club. Am I right? And see, this is what I didn't know. Yeah, she did. I she did not know that. She, I, used, I think she used to work there as a bartender a little bit too. Did you go to the premiere? You know what? I. I blew it off. I'm <laughs> okay, so where did you get that skirt with the race cars on it? Oh, isn't that cute? I love that. Yeah, that was uh, well, one of those punk rock stores on Melrose, you know, one of those ones, you know. And you picked it out? Of course, nice. yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I had a matching purse and all that. Somehow it's gotten lost. I still have the purse, but yeah, it was a, you know, it was a race car kind of deal. It was really cool. On your next album, From the Hip. Yes. Lindsey Buckingham makes an appearance on a song called Way Out West. Yes. Now tell me about that. Well, that was a fluke uh, occurrence. I was in England um, uh, finishing up that record with Roy Thomas Baker. Mm. And uh, he was also producing the cars mm. over there. And then Lindsey was hanging around. And so he says, Lindsey, you know, would you mind throwing some guitar on there? And he goes, oh, yeah. So it was, it was very spontaneous. and. You know, he just pretty much did it. He was an amazing guitar player, is amazing. So, yeah, that would just all went down very fast. And very fast, so you didn't get to really talk to him? Well, or? we went on a little trip. Uh, we all went on this, like, uh, boat cruise together. I think we got, like, caught on on this boat ride, and it was like R Roy was at the helm, and we, we got lost, and going to Liverpool to find the Beatles. <laughs> it was like this crazy thing with the cars and me and... Uh, you know, and Lindsay, and it was just one of these wild things, you know, that you, these moments that 
You look back on and laugh. Uh huh. So when are, you, when are you gonna? We write didn't die, so that was pretty funny. When are you gonna write the book? The book's coming. The book is coming. Because that's a pretty great story. And for those who don't know, Roy Thomas Baker is super famous for producing Night at the Opera, which has the song Bohemian Rhapsody yes. by Queen. No, he's a brilliant, brilliant yeah. fellow. And uh, yeah, so he 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 was just one of the you know all time great producers from that era, and it was he had taken over Elektra Records when they got fired my producers, mm -hmm. and then he came on to finish the record up, and so you know. How would you describe the sound of that record? Because he was very into big backup vocals and punchy yeah. snare drums, and yeah, you know. Well, I mean, he came in on the in, at the end, so a lot of it had already been put down and whatnot, but. Um, um, you know, he he was one of these guys who came at the beginning of the session. Yeah, you know, you know well, all right then, I'm off, and then you know, come back at the end of the day. You know, that that's how it was with me. It might have been very different. He let the engineer pretty much handle everything, and so I got very involved in. I actually had to go in and remix one of the songs myself. So, you know, he was. He, I think he had kind of uh, lost, been not so enchanted with production at that point. He mm. was more into running Elektra Records and this kind of thing. So I was kind of on my own in the studio. What were the highlights of your Frightened by Nightingales period? Um, my Frightened by Nightingales, um, I mean, in terms of a pop song in the world tonight was was uh, was the most pop you know, related song. That, it really, that was at the point in my life when I was doing records and then running as fast as I could running the other way so no one could hear the records. I really was so disenchanted with the music business. I, so uh, no one actually heard that, but that was my more like really dark, like it's a, a trailer park and you find a head, uh, you know, like a dismembered head and somebody's trailer and Tim Burton is filming it all. I mean, it was, it was that kind of record. So Darker. Darker. Okay. Like, r yes, r really dark, like a grizzly. And what year was that? I I don't even know. It was it was like the nineties something? Okay, something. all right. I don't know. I, <laughs> I I did a lot of records that never got released. Also, because as soon as I would finish, I'd go. I had to release it. Nah, now let's start the other one. And I just really? I have all these ones that I'll put out one of these days. Yeah, yeah. the box set. Yeah, the box set. That'd be really good. The blaring out show.